Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I hope you all are well. It's a great pleasure to wish you welcome to focus group six. How can energy modeling tools from Horizon 2020 projects contribute to national energy, climate, energy and climate plans? Uh, this is, uh, uh, as you know, uh, this uh, conference is a cooperation between the energy modeling projects in Horizon 2020 and the Commission. And this was one of the topics wanted by the Commission. Uh, this session is recorded. Uh, it will also be done a screenshot uh, during uh, this uh, session. Uh, we uh, want uh, to have questions as usual. Uh, so please connect to Slido, slido.com, and use the, uh, the code you see on your, on your uh, screen, hashtag EMPE underscore E2020. I hope you enjoy uh, the session. And then when we, if you go to the agenda uh, for today, there are first uh, meant to be four presentations about uh, the National Energy and Climate Plans. We are still missing one of the presenters, but we hope you will join soon. Then we will, uh, we will go through your questions uh, related to the presentations. Uh, each of these presentations are uh, planned to be around 10 minutes. We will have a presentation of tools relevant for the uh, plans. Uh, each presentation will be around one minute and then it will be possible to raise questions again related to the tools. So this is uh, the agenda uh, for this session. Uh, and then uh, we will start with uh, a presentation from the Commission um, uh, from um, Clément Serre uh, about national en uh, energy and climate plans. What are they? why they need to be built on strong analytic foundation. So please, Clément, we are looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for, for inviting me uh, to, to this, uh, to this uh, webinar. I think, uh, I think that it's a very, very re relevant topic and I've been asked to, to present uh, what the national energy and climate plans are and, uh, and why we need a, a strong modeling for that. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I'm going to do, and if you allow me, I, I would like to to also open uh, uh, maybe for a discussion. I think we have a few minutes uh, to see a bit uh, what the future looks like, uh, also from that point of view. So, <clears throat> simply to 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 explain a bit how it all started, I think the numbers which are on this slide you can uh, just ignore because uh, because um, they are a bit outdated. Uh, as you see in the communication uh, from 2014 already, um, we had this uh, this idea that uh, okay we have uh, we have to be ambitious for greenhouse gas reduction, and for that we need. Um, among other things, an ambitious target for renewables uh, and, and an EU target. Uh, but that uh, being said, it would not be binding for, for member states individually, so we would not have nationally binding uh, <clears throat> renewable target. And this is where uh, the need for a, a strong governance uh, framework emerged. Uh, how to make sure that we achieve our EU level objective without having national uh, targets. Of course, uh, the Council supported very much uh, the principle of having some flexibility and a bit of administrative streamlining. Um, uh, and I think another element important here in, in the Energy Council of November 2015 is this, this idea of coordination and cooperation. So regional cooperation is, a, is an important element of the of the governance. And of course, to, to cooperate with someone, uh, you have to trust him. And, and I think uh, in that perspective, uh, as regards trust, uh, it's also very important to have a robust analytical uh, basis and, and, uh, and a robust modeling framework uh, to be able to have like a neut neutralized conversation and, and conversation with partners uh, that you can you can trust. So 
the overarching objectives of, of this governance. I think they are all equally important, but here uh, for the topic that is of interest to us today, I would like to, to insist more maybe a bit on, uh, on two. Uh, so of course, the main objective is that we meet our energy union objectives, uh, notably the 2030 targets, but uh, also having in mind the, the 2050 perspective. And I think another element which I would like to emphasize is um, to enhance, enhance investor certainty and predictability. And here again, I think uh, modeling is key because, of course, um, it's relatively easy to have a political target or political objective, but I think once the investors see that it's actually backed by uh, a, a serious and, and robust uh, modeling, I think from, from that moment, they can trust that the objective is indeed attainable, it's feasible, uh, and, and then they can, they can prepare how they can contribute, how much they can invest. And of course, this has a, a very direct impact on things like um, the interest rate. And we know that in sectors like energy efficiency uh, or renewable uh, energy, uh, which are very capital intensive, uh, having a small decrease in the interest rate uh, can play a big role in the final cost of the energy transition. So uh, I think, again, here modeling is a very important aspect of the governance process. To explain uh, briefly how it works, um, at, the, at the core of the governance, we have uh, the National Energy and Climate Plans. NECPs, uh, the first uh, are covering the period, the, the, the next decade, basically, from 2021 to 2030. So 2030 objective is, is the, the final horizon. Uh, and then uh, along the, um, the decade, we will have national progress reports and a, a, a monitoring by the European Commission. So these NECPs themselves were, uh, we had two steps. Uh, we had the draft uh, National Energy and Climate Plans uh, end of 2018. Um, we provided, uh, we assessed them. Uh, when I say with the, the commission, we provided an assessment and we provided recommendations. Uh, again, if you remember the, the, the origin of, of the, the whole governance process, it's to make sure one of the most important objective of these recommendations is to make sure that we achieve our collective objectives for 2030. Uh, so we need to, to make sure that uh, the national contributions, notably for, for renewables, energy efficiency, and greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, there are uh, more dimensions than that, that the national contributions allow us to reach our objectives. So we made recommendations on the draft plans and we received the final plans and the end of uh, 2019 or early uh, 2020 actually for the last ones uh, and now we are about to to, to publish our final uh, our assessment of these final plans uh, so in a, in a in a few days um, and in the governance regulation, we have this uh, this annex which is the template that uh, the member state need to to follow uh for their plans so basically we have two parts uh, two sections the first section is uh, what we could call a, a more political section so the national plan uh, and the, the the other section is the analytical basis so you see that half of the national energy and climate plan is basically the analytical basis which illustrates i think the importance uh, of this aspect and, and for each of these sections, uh, it's divided in, in five uh, energy union dimensions. So the first one being decarbonization. So this includes uh, renewable, but also greenhouse gas emission reductions and uh, energy efficiency, energy security, internal market and research innovation and competitiveness. So here you see a bit the structure of the plan. You have national objectives and targets followed by policies and measures. So of course the policies and measures we need to make sure that they allow uh, the member state to achieve its, its targets. Uh, and the analytical part, it's, uh, it's, it's on, on the one hand, a description of the current situation uh, and, and projections. Uh, so projections to the horizon of 2030, but also at least until 2040. 
uh, and then an assessment, uh, an impact assessment of the policies and measures that the member state put forward in its plans. What are the impacts of these policies and measures in terms uh, not only of the energy system, of course, uh, but um, greenhouse gas emission reductions, but also macroeconomic impact uh, on GDP, employment, social impacts, uh, environmental impacts, for instance, on, on, on air quality, um, the needs in terms of uh, upskilling and reskilling, so, so quite an encompassing impact assessment that we have asked uh, member states to, to do. So th that was the 2030 framework um, until um, some days ago, but uh, as you know, now we have a climate law uh, which enshrines the objective of the EU being climate neutral by 2050 uh, into law. Um, and for that, uh, basically, we realized that we need to have a more ambitious step uh, milestone by 2030. So, so this is where the, the climate target plan comes in, um, and we have now uh, the economy-wide GHG target of at least minus 55% by 2030. Um, I will pass quickly because um, time is, is flying, but uh, very quickly on, on what we see in the NECPs, uh, so the final NECPs, uh, for renewable energy, um, uh, we achieve our target um, because we would reach 33 uh, between 33.1 and 33.7 percent of renewable energy in final uh, gross energy consumption by 2030. So this is above our target, but for energy efficiency we still have a gap. So when you add up all the contributions by member states, you still see that there is a gap between around three percent, uh, three percentage points. Uh, for for both primary and final energy consumption. Um, so so basically now that we have a more ambitious target for 2030. So just as a reminder, the target used to be minus 40 percent of GHG um, emissions. Uh, now it's minus 55. So of course that uh, implies that we need to go further for both renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, so for instance. Uh, energy efficiency, we would need to decrease by uh, 36, between 36 and 41 percent, uh, depending if you are talking about final energy consumption or primary. Um, and for renewable, we would need to increase to uh, between 38 to 40 percent renewables. Uh, yes. um, Only one so minute left, please. One minute left, thank you. Uh, so, so that leaves me enough time, I think, to, to I, I guess the main message here is that uh, there will be need, uh, member states may need to update their NECP, uh, possibly rather soon. So that implies, uh, of course, needs in terms of, of modeling and analytical basis, because we need to, to know uh, where we are going. And this is also true uh, to assess the investment needs because um, uh, being that ambitious uh, requires huge investments. Uh, you can see here, um, the blue is basically the baseline, the, the blue bar, uh, the light pink is uh, the, the current 2030 objective, and the, the green pink is if we go to minus 55%. And, and uh, if you, basically the difference between the two, uh, the green, the, the pink bar is plus 260 billion euros per year, and uh, the green bar that would increase to around 350 billion euros per year compared to the baseline. So the investment needs are significant, and and you know that we have now uh, the recovery funds um, uh, which are available, uh, in particular the recovery and resilience facility. Um, and we have we have a lot of funding available, and member states uh, are to prepare recovery plans, including uh, an estimation of their investment needs to achieve the green transition, to implement the the, the energy clean energy transition. And this is why uh, I think there are strong and urgent uh, needs for for precise modeling and for good estimation of the investment needs to achieve uh, our targets. 
thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Clamoa, for this interesting uh, presentation about uh, what are uh, the, uh, the national energy and the climate plans, how are they structured, the uh, need for a modeling approach, etc. So thank you very much. Uh, we will then continue with the presentations from two member states and a uh, region uh, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to uh, welcome uh, the, the Deputy Minister of Energy from Bulgaria. Uh, please, Sheko Stanko, we are happy to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to, to participate in this uh, webinar. I hope it will be useful for all participants. And of course, it would help uh, also ourselves to understand the missing points. Thanks to the colleague from the Commission for the good presentation. And the, the future which is, uh, which is coming with the new targets, it will be challenging, but also opportunity for each of the member states. From my side, maybe a few words at the beginning. Uh, uh, maybe for, for the people which are following the whole process related with the clean energy package uh, could know that uh, me personally was the, the, the leader of the trial of negotiations for the energy efficiency directive, renewables directive and governance regulation. It was really a challenging time for negotiating with the colleagues with, uh, from the parliament. And now uh, all this which was presented from the colleague from the European Commission uh, became alive and we have the second version ready uh, and let's say uh, waiting for, for some additional remarks or from the side of the Commission. But uh, how it looks like uh, in our eyes in Bulgaria, uh, we prepare and send uh, uh, at the beginning of 2019 the first draft of the NECP. Uh, there were about 10 recommendations and we tried in the final version uh, which we sent at the beginning of this year to the Commission to, to solve all the issues. Uh, actually, the, to, the, the, main, the main topics uh, related with the, with the five pillars of the plan, uh, we are committed from our side related with renewables energy. We increase related with the draft uh, NECP the renewables target from 25 to 27 percent. Of course, we uh, touched also the three uh, trajectories related with heating, cooling, uh, uh, renewables in the electricity and uh, transport. Uh, there, our, bind, uh, our, our targets uh, will be uh, 40, about 42 percent for renewables in heating, cooling, 32 uh, percent in electricity, and uh, 14 per, a little bit more than 14% in the transport. Uh, we hope that we contribute enough to the to, to reaching the, 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 the overall European target and how you already saw in the presentation from the Mr. Sarah, uh, Sarah is uh, uh, good to say that uh, we overachieved at the moment the, the existing target. Of course, uh, the energy efficiency in the primary and final energy consumption, we uh, managed to, to, to be committed for 27% in the uh, primary and about 30, a little bit less than 32 in the final energy consumption. Uh, in the topic related with the security of uh, energy supply, we were very detailed uh, with the whole opportunities, diversification of the energy supply, which is a very important topic on our territory. We all remember 2009 and the problems with the uh, uh, with delivering gas during the winter in our region. Uh, we and uh, our colleagues from uh, Slovakia were the big losers. That's why we put uh, accent uh, in our plan of diversification of gas supply. And of course, uh, using our resources like uh, wind, uh, uh, sun, sun, uh, sun as uh, opportunity for producing electricity from PVs. And of course, last but not least, uh, the existing infrastructure coming uh, and produced electricity from the thermal power plants coming from coal. Of course, with decreasing uh, with decreasing importance and uh, production from these uh, facilities in the future. Um, what is uh, also important to mention is the liberalization process related with the energy market uh, in Bulgaria, which is ongoing process. Uh, which actually from the 1st of October, just a week ago, we make the second step after 
the first step uh, sending all the big uh, enterprises which are on the medium and high vo voltage grid uh, to the free market with establishing uh, energy exchange. Also, uh, after 1st of October, all the, 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 the medium and small enterprises, doesn't matter if it's on the low voltage grid or the medium and high voltage grid, should uh, participate and buy their energy or their energy could, uh, should be uh, uh, delivered by, by, the, by the free market prices. Um, I'm explaining these things a little bit faster than, than planned from my side, but here uh, I want to, to, to push a special accent on this that nobody believed that, uh, that uh, so far we negotiated uh, the governance regulation, that uh, some troubles like COVID-19 will come on us as uh, uh, member states and, uh, let's say, European citizens. My personal opinion at the moment is that in the near future, even before 2023, we should uh, intervene in the uh, in the in, in these plans. Uh, as the colleague already mentioned, even the, the just two days ago, the colleagues in the European Parliament voted not for 45 decrease of greenhouse gas emissions um, until 2030. They voted for 60% decrease. Of course, it's up to the final trilogues what will be the final target until 2030. Of course. One is sure in our energy and climate plan at the moment, the decrease of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the target we, we see that is possible to reach with the not existing targets at the moment is 49% uh, uh, decrease of the greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, that's, that's uh, our calculation and uh, our model calculated this before speaking uh, for new targets, for new future targets in the energy efficiency, renewables, uh, and of course, it seems uh, reasonable that the ETS will be also open and renegotiated between the member states. But here, one should to be clear that uh, uh, it has to think about uh, all member states and keeping the competitiveness of the economy of the whole regions, because Bulgaria, for example, is very dangered by uh, carbon leakage. Uh, why? Because uh, three from our five neighbors are not uh, European member states, which means that industries like uh, cement industry, steel, steel industry and, uh, uh, and fertilizers uh, could easily move a few hundred kilometers away from the territory of uh, Bulgaria to Mas North Macedonia, Serbia and Turkey uh, without uh, thinking about the restriction of the environment uh, or environment restriction or the ETS scheme. Um, we, are, we are keeping this in mind and we are, we are not stopping repeating this uh, loudly uh, in front of our colleagues and partners from the European Commission and the other member states. And we hope uh, that they, they gonna understand and they gonna develop uh, in the future the draft, the new draft documents, which will include our, our proposal. Of course, um, which is very important here, uh, at the draft energy and climate plans, it wasn't possible uh, to include a very important uh, uh, funds like uh, uh, recovery and resilience fund and uh, just transition fund, which are part of uh, JTF was, uh, was one of the first uh, uh, published uh, document part of the Green Deal. And of course, uh, recovery and resilience fund was uh, helping the member states going out from the COVID crisis. These two financial, instru financial instruments will help us a lot for uh, economic transformation. One should to be clear related with the JTF. Uh, after making the assessment uh, from the green tra transition in Bulgaria, we recognize something. We have three uh, co-regions uh, which will be heavily impacted uh, by the green transition. But we have also the regions in which we have the, the big industry, energy intensive industry, carbon intensive industry, will, which uh, will also. Uh, sorry for the cabinet of the minister. Just a second. Sorry. Uh, and uh, from, from our personal opinion is uh, that the money coming from the JTF, from the economic transition, uh, and will, uh, should be not just uh, focused on the coal regions, but also in the regions 
which are heavily impacted, where the, the industry will be heavily impacted with the idea to keep the competitiveness in these regions and uh, to keep the industry in these regions. Uh, of course, for recovery and resilience plans, we are also uh, very glad to, to see the topics and the opportunities for future projects which could contribute to the reaching the final targets. Uh, uh, and so here we are speaking that 37% from this money should be used for uh, green projects and 20% uh, for dig digitalization. The both, the both uh, topics are very important for us because the digitalization in the energy sector uh, will help a lot of the transition in integration of renewables and uh, modern energy efficiency uh, monitoring infrastructure. And of course, uh, the, the green projects at, at all will uh, contribute, of course, again, uh, I repeat myself, but to, to, let's say, to fulfill our existing and, of course, future targets for renewables and energy efficiency. Um, please end with in one minute, please. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I will focus myself in the very last minute uh, in the energy efficiency. Uh, we are planning at the moment with uh, approving our uh, energy efficiency strategy, uh, concentrating ourselves uh, of establishing a decarbonization fund, which will help the private sector, the, the public sector, and of course, medium small enterprises for making future investment in energy efficiency. And the best energy we have is the not used energy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and thank you for taking your time. I hope you can stand, um, still join us to the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the part with the questions uh, uh, after the two next presentations. There are now uh, 86 uh, person, uh, persons. Uh, did you... oh, sorry, sorry interrupting yeah. you. Uh, yeah. I should leave because the, the call I received from my minister was that we should okay. move to the Council of Ministers by the Deputy Prime Minister meeting. Uh, if there are some questions, if it's possible to answer now and to leave. Yes. Um... Uh, is it possible to have, are there any questions uh, on the slider? Uh, we could uh, ask uh, Mr. Stanko now. Uh, there are okay. no yeah. questions now. Okay, then everything was clear. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stanko, and um, have a nice day. So then uh, we will continue uh, this session uh, with uh, a presentation from Spain. Uh, and we are very happy to have with us Miriam Buano Lorenzo, Deputy Director General of Prospective Strategy and Regulation on Energy, Ministry of Ecological Transition and the Democratic Challenge uh, in Spain. So uh, Miriam, please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Ingevar, for, for, for introducing me. Um, thank you, all the EMP uh, modeling platform for inviting me to this, to this interesting session. Um, I, I am going to present the Spanish National Energy and Climate Plan for 2021 to 2030. And uh, I would like to, to explain a little bit that, that my presentation is very focused on, on the modeling, uh, given that uh, Clement has explained uh, the, the context of the National Energy and Climate Plan. So I would like to start by setting up which are the Spain's objectives for 2030, that is the decade uh, where, or the, the, the decade where the the Spanish energy, National Energy and Climate Plan is going to be implemented. So uh, the target that we set is um, a reduction of 23% of greenhouse gas emissions with respect to 1990. In, in regarding with the renewable energy uh, penetration over the final energy consumption, uh, we set a target of 42% and uh, in terms of energy efficiency, uh, an increase of 39.5 percent uh, with respect with the reference scenario that was set by the by the European Commission several years years ago, and um, we we have this decrease. 
So um, I would like to explain also that this 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 target for 2030 is a milestone in the way to the climate neutrality that we we are planning to achieve in 2050. So uh, at, in 2050, at least uh, the the um, the target is at, at least 90% uh, of the of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions um, with respect to 1990. And uh, we have a, another intermediate milestone in 2040 in line with both the NECP and also the climate neutrality. So uh, to conclude that, uh, the, this climate neutrality uh, that is translated into a, this reduction of 90% of greenhouse gas emissions that will be compensated by the by the sinks uh, of, for emissions, uh, will be uh, together with a renewable energy, uh, 100 renewable energy uh, power sector by by this year so i would like also to mention that this this target this objectives and the elaboration of the national energy and climate plan uh, is is for us at this moment in time where we are designing the recover the the resilience and recovery plans that are related to the resilience and recovery facility um, all the policies and measures and measures that we set in this in this uh, national energy and climate plan are the guideline for us to uh, design the RRIF plan. So uh, this this plan is this uh, the the exercise of doing the national energy and climate plan was very useful in this moment. I, will, I, I would like to also mention that uh, these objectives are, if you can, if you can remember the, the objectives for the European U Union that Clement uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, are very in, li in line uh, with the European Union, and uh, we we think that Spain uh, is made a, a big uh, contribution uh, to achieve this carbon neutrality in 2050 and to achieve all the targets set uh, at the European level. So uh, I, I'm not going to mention this because Clement has mentioned before and explained uh, which is the structure of the NECP. So I will start uh, to mention uh, which are the different models that we have to we when when we started the, this exercise that is news for is new for all the member states and I think that this is one of the main challenges we have to select one model uh, between all the big portfolio of model that uh, I think that all the all the public uh, that is here in this in this conference will know because uh, I, I guess that the main the the most of the people that is in this conference is uh, entirely dedicated to, to modeling. So we have to to select this this model uh, that. Uh, finally, was Markle Times. Um, uh, I would like to also mention that the training needs in this case is some months. So, uh, one of the big challenges for us was to to be trained in the use of these energy models. Um, apart from that, related with the model, uh, in the last slide I was mentioned the times the times model uh, that uh, you can find in the left uh, side of the of the slide in the center um, uh, with this model we plan which are all the needs in reference with the with the energy sector but this model was also also soft link with many other models so i will try to to explain this this slide by saying that the results uh, of, of the power system as this time synergy model has a, a big uh, um, a big granularity we all only use uh, 14 tiny slices. We need uh, to have a dedicated model for the power system uh, in order to, to take all the data for power system capacity and, and also demand and use a, 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 dispatch, a model of economic dispatch uh, for the, this power system. And uh, we use two different models. One uh, that was managed for the TSO of, of the energy system, Red Electrica de España, and the other uh, that was developed by the University of Comillas. With this uh, power system model, we check that we don't need any backup needs. Uh, we check also the exchange in the interconnection and, and in summary, that we don't we don't have any security or supply issues for, for the results of, of this model as uh, given that we are um, 
reaching a, a, re, a really big uh, share of renewable energies in the power system. Apart from that, uh, we use another another model to project all the all the greenhouse gas emission and other pollutant gases pro emission projection. And for this, we uh, introduce the results of the model M3E that is in the center of the slide that uh, provide us all the emissions that are not related to the energy sector. Apart from that, and uh, following the the, um, the methodology used in, this, in the Spanish inventory system, we have all the greenhouse gas emissions and pollutant, pollutant gases emissions projections for, for the whole Spanish uh, system. And uh, after that, uh, we use both the results of the energy sector and the results of the, of the gases emissions to analyze the, both the economic impact with, the, with an input-output model uh, developed by the European Commission that is based on Fidelio, and which name is Denio and was developed by, by uh, Research Center in Spain, the BC3, and also included uh, the health impacts uh, by using a model TM5 FAST that uh, employed, which are the, the main um, pollutant concentration in a geog geographical uh, dimension uh, for Spain. So, coming back to the energy model, time synergia, the, uh, we use this times model that was developed by the uh, International Energy a Agency and it's a bottom-up model. I think that is this very very well known, known this this model and this model calculates all the energy needed to cover the long-term demand but opti by optimizing the cost of the energy system given some assumptions that I will mention later. For, for setting up uh, the model, I, I would like to explain a little bit the model data structure. So uh, we set uh, a, a base year reference in 2016 uh, in this structure with, uh, from this base year that uh, when, when we need to call it several data from very different stakeholders and also made an analysis of the coherence of the data that I think that is one of the big challenges. Coming from that, we did all the demand projections uh, with both the economic assumptions uh, provided by the European Commission and also internal data that we, we have. And we applied several scenarios and constraints and uh, the evolution of the, of the technologies for the future. The input data for Time Synergia uh, covers all the, all the sectors, uh, the industry, residential, commercial and public, transport and mobility, uh, all the uh, sector related to energy, that is the uh, power sector and the fuels, and uh, I would like to mention that the model needs a great amount of data. We also have to introduce all the main policies and measures that we have to put in place to achieve the target that we set to achieve this uh, climate neutrality in 2050. And uh, I would like to, to, for, to finish, to mention, we'll, we'll, to summarize a little bit which were our main modeling challenges. First of all, the model selection, also uh, or to collect all, all the data uh, with all these several stakeholders and to give this data coherence. I would like to take advan advantage of this occasion to say that uh, we also use this exercise to, to improve our energy statistics and all the statistics in, in Spain. And also, uh, we, we all, other of the challenge is to define which is the granularity of the model, uh, to define the base year and all the model characteristics. The introduction of hypotheses, that is the transition of policies and measures into the model, it was other of the main challenges. And also uh, setting up the uh, scenarios because in the exercise of the, of the that uh, was uh, planned by the European Commission, we need all, both a reference and objective a scenario, and also to achieve all these targets. So this is an iterative project with uh, with uh, both of, with many models involved. So for the part of the of the modeling of the modeling, I would like to conclude that the modeling of the energy system depends a lot on the exercise and analysis proposed. And in in addition to modeling, uh, I think that the process must be put in place to involve all the actors, all the stakeholders involved in the energy system. And to finish this presentation, I would like to summarize uh, which are the results of the National Energy and Climate Plan. 
As I have mentioned before, it's a reduction of 23% of the greenhouse gas emission versus 1919, 42% of renewable energy over final energy demand, 39.5% 39, 39 of energy efficiency improvement, and also 74% of renewable energy in the power sector. And our main objective is to achieve the carbon neutrality in 2050. And about the macroeconomic impacts of the energy uh, of the national energy and climate plans that were very positive for Spain and that are also the basic for the for designing the recovery and resilience plan, the total investment is uh, 241,000 million euros between uh, in the decade and also the energy imports of fossil fuels that uh, were, were saving by the introduction of renewable energy were calculated in, in our plan and amount uh, 67,000 uh, million uh, in between 2021 and 2030. Also the GDP experienced uh, an increase of uh, about uh, 2% and we experienced an increment in employment and a reduction of premature deaths. Um, Thank you for 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 the presentation. And if you have any pressure, any questions, I will be glad to answer them later. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Uh, as you said, there are a lot of energy modelers in uh, in the audience, so this is a very interesting presentation for uh, for us. So then uh, the fourth and uh, the last uh, presentation from uh, this part of uh, this uh, session uh, is uh, from um, is energy planning in the region Piemonte in Italy and uh, Silvio De Nigris, a public officer at the sustainable energy sector in Piemonte will uh, give this presentation. So uh, Silvio, we are looking forward to what you have to say to us today. We can't hear you. No? <laughs> okay, I think now it's working. Yes. And fine. Uh, I guess also for my screen or not. Can you see the screen? Can you confirm just? Yes, it's fine. Okay, good. So I will start and uh, with just a brief introduction of, uh, of the region and then I will go through our energy economic activities. Uh, uh, the, so I'm representing uh, the region of Piemonte, which is uh, settled in the northwest part of Italy. It's uh, about 4.5 million of inhabitants with the capital city of Torino with uh, less than 1 million of inhabitants. So the, the region is one of the most important regions in terms of economic power in, in Italy and our economic is based on uh, mechanical industry and agri-food industry as well and also we have quite a large share of our GDP concentrated in uh, um, service uh, and, and commerce. Uh, so we are close to the border of France uh, with 43% uh, of our territory, which is mountain, and we have a very fragmented uh, uh, administrative uh, situation with more than 1,000 uh, <coughs> municipalities and eight provinces. Okay, here I presented just a picture of the energy system uh, of, of the region. I, don't, I will not go into detail uh, of that, but just to, I want to point out some, some important uh, information just to, 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 to pick up some peculiarities of our region. So we can see that most of our uh, primary energy is based on import. Uh, and we have uh, just internal production of uh, uh, renewables, uh, uh, and I would say solar and biomass and hydropower, <clears throat> as we don't have wind, for example. And uh, then what is also uh, very important is that our um, energy system is mainly based on, uh, on natural gas, which is used directly in the, in the final sectors, but um, also, a very large part of it is used in transformation sector for the production of electricity um, and uh, um, and uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, I lost my presentation. Okay, electricity and 
eat. We have quite a large business eating network in the in the city of Torino. So if we move to final energy uh, consumption uh, here uh, again, uh, just a few pictures about the sectors uh, where it is uh, quite evident that we are still uh, quite dependent uh, on uh, fossil fuels, uh, even though uh, renewables are, are starting to, to play a big role also. And if we have a look at what is happening in the last few years, uh, we, we should say that uh, not much is happening since uh, we are facing a period where the final energy consumption are quite stable so, um, and uh, more than 10. Uh, uh, means of oil uh, 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 equivalent. Uh, as I said, uh, a, a big share is uh, on natural gas. Uh, <clears throat> also, we have uh, still quite a large amount of oil products used uh, in, in mainly in the transport sector. Of course. And uh, what about renewables? Renewables are, are uh, increasing, but not that much. Uh, and uh, nowadays, we are in the 18% of the final energy consumption is, uh, is a share of, uh, of renewables, uh, which are equally divided into into electricity and uh, and the thermal use of renewables uh, so that's what happened in the last years and uh, we have some targets which have been fixed in a uh, energy plans that's been uh, endorsed by the executive board of the of the region uh, which fixed some uh, targets preliminary targets for 2020 and 2030 as you can see, the, the trend uh, are online, but not that much. We should speed up a little bit uh, in this uh, in this sense to reach the targets. That and, and these targets, uh, I have to say, uh, have to be revised according to the new uh, EU strategy that has been presented today and uh, previously, and also according to the national energy energy plan. So we are uh, doing some of uh, assessment uh, and uh, mm, uh, data collection activities, mainly in the framework of, of, of this integrated uh, Central Europe project, Prospect 2030, which I will just mention later on. Uh, and I want to tell you that uh, we are uh, committed in the data collection activity in statistical, uh, publishing some statistic data of, of our region uh, since a few years. Um, and um, as I said, we have a very large amount of municipalities and we are supporting them in their local energy planning, in the, mainly in the, in the framework of the Covenant of Major Initiative, but also other related uh, initiative. I think this is very important. Just try to collect uh, and act as uh, energy observatory to get uh, all the information uh, on board uh, and provide them to the municipalities which uh, face some okay lack of tech, uh, technical expertise. Uh, and so, so we are trying to support them. This process. Um, I just want to go to the end of the, my presentation, just show you some some uh, very interesting information related to what uh, happened uh, this year. Of course, uh, here I compared uh, <clears throat> data coming from um, uh, petrol sales uh, uh, in, in this year, which is the red line, uh, compared with uh, the previous three years. Uh, and uh, here you can very click clearly uh, see the, the, the impact of the lockdown during uh, this, uh, the, the spring, uh, springtime. This is for petrol, this is also for diesel. The situation is pretty similar, even though, uh, to say for petrol, we reached in, in some of the same values of all the former years, but uh, this is not the case for, for diesel. Uh, there is a, 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 a model uh, shift uh, from, from one field to the other and also I think the last summer great transportation still uh, as uh, it was before and also we can <clears throat> show you some interesting uh, diagram also on, on the same situation related to electricity so this is uh, a diagram uh, in which the peak loads uh, the daily peak load are are, are provided. So the blue line is uh, 2020, the red line is uh, uh, 2019, and the green ones is the <clears throat> is the is the difference between them. 
So uh, here it is uh, again very evident that uh, during lockdown, which is here starting March, April, and so on, so the situation was dramatically um, uh, the, the consumption dramatically uh, decreased, and also the the, the curve is more flat uh, than uh, in in the previous year. So it means that uh, all these peaks. Uh, uh, for me, are mainly industry activities that uh, uh, were uh, almost closed during uh, during this spring. So this is very interesting, also for in the view of making a new uh, forecast for for the future. Of, of of course, this year happened something very very peculiar that we have to take into account when we think about revising the the, um, the targets for for the future. Okay, so uh, we are doing these activities, as I said, in the in the framework of this uh, interreg project, where uh, seven uh, regions across um, <clears throat> across uh, Central Europe are joining together, working together to draft the sustainable energy action plan, and uh, also providing some. Uh, uh, training and for learning activities uh, in order to spread out the achievement of the project. And um, okay, if you did, don't know what to do on the 14th of October, you can join this um, this talk uh, organized in the European Week of Region and Cities, where we are going to, to discuss a little bit about uh, uh, carbon neutrality for region. And okay, thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, the interesting presentation and the invitation to the webinar. And also thank you for being on time. So we have uh, yeah, eight minutes for questions. Uh, so I hope the audience ha has been active and uh, posted questions on Slido. Okay, so the top question, uh, based on your modeling experiences with the uh, National Energy and Climate Plans, how likely do you consider the possibility that uh, an NCEP could be built exclusively based on open source data? So uh, I suppose uh, this is a question to Miriam then. Okay, thank you, Ingeborg. Um, thank you for, for the question. Um, uh, I think that this is, of course, this is a possibility of uh, using an open source data for that. Uh, um, I, I think that this is possible when we assess all the the models that we can we can use for for doing this exercise of the National Energy and Climate Plan. We, we use Time Synergia mainly because there was a public, public research institution of Spain that has already done a model that so for us was was a really a really good uh, a nice start. But uh, I think that this is a possibility, of course. Okay, that's interesting. So uh, also addressed to Miriam. Uh, what are the, the modeling developments expected to downscale NCEPs into regional local plans? Have you considered linkages with other model tools? Uh, it seems that it's something more there that I don't see. But okay, maybe the uh, or the question is oh, there. Thanks. Pardon? Okay. It's just thanks. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, uh, I I recognize recognize also the person that uh, that uh, made the the question. Uh, and of course, uh, we think that now uh, in related with the national energy and climate plans, we are aware that uh, a lot of regions in Spain are also developing their their plans. So we are widely open to share all the information that they need and. To have a, co uh, a confluence between all the results at the national uh, level and also the disaggregated of the regional national uh, energy plans. And uh, of course, uh, we we already consider linkage with other modeling tools, and we are uh, advancing in in the assessment of which 
uh, many other modeling tools that we can we can use to go improving uh, our modeling. Thank you. Thank you. And then it's a question from Gabriel. Uh, what about the period 2030 to 2050 and updates of national plans for meeting climate neutrality ambitions? Any possible time frame for this? Thanks. I guess I can, I can try to, to answer. Yeah. Uh, yes, you are a bit far away, Clément. Maybe I need to speak in, in the mic. That's better. Yeah. Um, the very good news for Gabriel is that the NCPs is a never-ending process, so so we will have uh, lots of other plans. Uh, so one plan covers a decade, so the first one goes until 2030, and then we we should have the same process again for the following decade from 2030 to 2040, uh, and and and, and etc. So so yeah, normally we should have again. Uh, end of 2028, a draft uh, plan, uh, end of 2029, a final plan, taking into account commission recommendation, uh, and then this will cover the, the following decade. And uh, as far as modeling is concerned, then the next plans, um, end of the next decade, should cover uh, the period until 2050. Uh, so, so then, uh, at least in terms of modeling, we should cover the period until 2050. But <clears throat> I would like, uh, sorry, my presentation was a bit fast because I wanted to, to, to say a lot, but uh, maybe that was too fast. I think it's important to keep in mind also that there, there should be, um, or the, the member state can update their plans already uh, in the middle of, of, of the next decade. So provide a draft uh NECP draft update uh by the end of 2023 and then a final update by the end of 2024 uh, and this does not exclude the possibility to have an even earlier update also having in mind that the new ambition uh, that we have at the eu level uh, so with this new ambition uh, of course the member state uh, may realize that they need to also increase their own ambition at national level uh, and therefore submit a, an updated plan so so i'm sure there will be plenty of, of plans uh, in the next uh, years yes it seems like that um I, about, uh, I, yeah. I don't know if i can add something to the question uh, because they yes, asked please. about about the period 2030 to 2050 and I, I would like to mention also that we we have the obligation of doing a long-term strategy that covers the whole period mm -hmm. from 2021 yes. to 2050 thank you mm -hmm. yeah thank you for that uh, clarification uh so then uh, we have yeah this will be the last uh, question uh, because you also need time for presentation of the tools. So Hanna has asked which methods for carbon border adjustment are, cur are currently discussed in the Commission as uh, potential viable options. Uh, so uh, Clement, could you uh, I, uh, respond to this question? Or, uh, um yeah this the, so carbon adjustment uh, mechanisms is, is indeed uh, being discussed um it's it's a it's a complex exercise because uh of course we have uh i mean we are bound with uh, with uh, trade uh, trade regulation um so 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 when it comes to the very specific tools at our disposal I'm afraid I won't be able to answer because this is being dealt with uh, mostly in other directorate, uh, director generals, uh, DG Trade, uh, notably. Uh, so, so I won't be able to tell you what exactly are, are the options uh, uh, privileged at this stage uh, for, for implementing a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, but, but I think uh, I think it's definitely on. Uh, on the table, and now they are looking at uh, exactly how we can make this compatible with, uh, with trade uh, trade rules. Okay. Thank you very much. We are going to uh, 
presentation of possible tools uh, or tools that could be used for de uh, development and assessment uh, of uh, national energy and climate plans. If you want to uh, to stay, of course, that's uh, you are very much welcome to do that. But if you uh, want to leave, I say thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, so then uh, there will be a session of around uh, 15 minutes with presentation of tool or relevant tools for national energy and climate plans. And uh, the presentations of the tools are also available on B2Match in the session description. Uh, uh, so if it uh, goes too fast now, uh, you have the possibility of looking at the presentation afterwards. So we start with the energy system uh, model, Genesis mod. So please, uh, Carlo, uh, you have one minute. Yes, so uh, hello everybody, my name is Carlo. Um, I'm going to present you uh, our global energy system model, Genesis mod, which uh, also is being used uh, in the Open Entrance project and uh, was developed by us at Technical University of Berlin. Um, generally, Genesis Mod is a linear techno-economic framework uh, where also basically lies the, the huge strength of Genesis Mod is that it's very flexible. It's just a framework um, where the user, depending on its input that it's uh, being put into the model, can determine uh, what the, the subject of analysis will be. Um, it includes the sector electricity, industry buildings and transportation. Um, the regional focus is very flexible again, it can be used or it was also used uh, for analysis on a global scale, but also country studies or multi-regional studies are uh, possible. And a very, uh, another very good feature of Genesis Mod is that um, it makes it very easy to compare results from different scenarios which are being used. So in the case of uh, using or trying to implement any CPs, it makes it very easy to uh, show or to analyze how different measures would uh, have different impacts on the energy system. Um, right, so if you go to the next slide, there's just a couple of case studies which already have been conducted, uh, which mostly focus on different regional areas, but also have other um, features included, like for example, the effect of short-sightedness uh, of policy action uh, in, the, in the discussion of stranded assets. And with that, um, yeah, I would uh, like to finish. There's some information on the last slide where you can find uh, more information or contact us. And with that, I'm happy to pass over to the next presenter. Thank you very much, Carlo. We just uh, go on with the multi-carrier market design tool. So please, Anna. So I'm uh, going to present a tool that we developed within the scope of a magnitude project. And therein, uh, we looked really in the market uh, aspects of the sector coupling. So if you go to the next slide, then um, uh, so this is just a scheme of the tool that we developed. Um, what we uh, try to achieve is uh, really to to look into how we can um, support this, the, the the sector coupling uh, in a market based way because all the energy uh, sectors are really operated in a in a market way. And uh, currently it is unclear what is a good market-based coordination for our energy system to reach the climate ambitions and uh, therefore we developed this tool. So if you go on the next slide, um, uh, we developed it in Julia and, and Python. Um, so what this tool can be used for is uh, we can evaluate different uh, multi-carrier market designs um, and we evaluate them in terms of um, economic efficiency or operational integration of renewable energy sources um, and then this in, uh, we expect uh, can help European Commission and regulators and market operators to make a, an educated decision about what should be the market adaptations so that we really reach this better sector integration and we really leverage on additional flexibility for for instance uh, gas sector to the electricity sector. Uh, next to that we um we no 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 previous slide i'm not done yet uh, this this tool can also um, uh, help evaluate different uh, uh, market profits for technology and that can be then used for investors for instance they can um, already calculate what is their expected profit and they can help them then um, uh, maybe be more brave to invest in uh, in technologies that can also mitigate the climate uh, change 
So in conclusion, our tool should be able to help the policy and decision makers in achieving a, a proper market-based coordination of the energy system. Thank you so very with much. With that, I would like to, uh, to give the word over to the next presenter. Yes, thank you very much, Anna. And then it's uh, it's planned for uh, you, uh, uh, Sandrine, please. Okay, so thank you very much. The, the plan for EU model is uh, being implemented within the H2020 funded uh, plan for res project. E uh, what it is uh, doing, it's a model that is composed of uh, three different layers that are all embedded. Um, the, the first one is um, the unit commitment, which computes optimal schedules and marginal costs. Then we have a seasonal storage valuation, which uses the unit commitment as a as a valuation um, a solver. The seasonal storage valuation will compute water values and the strategies for all the storages. And then above that, we have a capacity expansion model, which computes um, a generation mix uh, for uh, generation storage and also um, line capacities, extension of lines uh, for only one year. So it's focused on electricity only and can be adapted to uh, very uh, different kinds of uh, geographical systems. So we can have a whole Europe or a small part of Europe or one country uh, with uh, the exchanges with uh, the borders or a region inside the country. Um, so what has it been used and is uh, used uh, from now? Uh, we are doing some uh, different kinds of studies within the, the project, uh, like evaluating what the impact of different level of renewable integration have on the costs, or evaluating the value of flexibility, uh, which is uh, the system cost reduction from using flexibility potentials, or also we're trying to evaluate the impact of climate change, because uh, all this is stochastic and we are relying on uh, different climatic scenarios from the Copenhagen climate change service that was presented yesterday. Um, so the main use of this model for, from our point of view is to assess the feasibility and the cost of long-term scenarios coming from uh, RJ, the Genesis model that Carlo just presented. So any questions we have, we, are, uh, we have a website and everything. So I will now leave the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Uh, Andres uh, from Comillas will present Open Tepas. Hello, Andres. Are you there? Um... Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh... thank you. Now I can hear you. Okay, um, I'm going to present, I'm Andro Ramos, I belong to Comillas University, I'm going to present the Open Tepes. The idea behind this model is try to introduce transparency and simplicity in power system planning. Next slide. Uh, the model the model has been conceived as a generation and transmission uh, expansion planning model with at the same time being able to represent the unit commitment or the operating details of the of the system. Uh, it has been set up as an optimization model where we are able to deal with, let's say, any kind of detail in the operation, especially on the uh, operation of storage or flexible facilities at the operational level. So on one hand, that model was an evolution of the previous one, the TEPES one that was coded in GAMS and was, uh, let's say, property model. And however, we have extracted some part of this model in order to create the open TEPES model. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the previous model was used in different, was developed uh, under different uh, H2020 project, uh, European projects model, where we main, were mainly focusing on uh, trying to analyze which is the impact at the transmission level of different scenarios, long-term scenarios. On the one hand, the, derived from the, let's say, generation expansion, and then we were addressing the impact on the transmission on the transmission network. And we were cooperating in different projects, in different European project models in, in order to do that. Nowadays, 
we are planning or we are using this model more to evaluate or to assess uh, the different kind of storage uh, storage uh, uh, systems, for example, pumped storage hydro or batteries at operational level, and and try to compare both in the medium or long term. And that is all from my side. In the next slide, you can see that uh, the the model is freely available in different sites, and you can download in and use for your own purposes. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Andres. So then we will turn to some uh, local models, Fresh and Gusto. Uh, so please, Sebastian, we are uh, we are looking forward to the presentation of those tools. Uh, thank you, Ingeborg, for the introduction. Um, I will present the two open source models, Freshcom and Gusto. Um, both models focus on local energy systems. Um, for example, uh, urban neighborhoods are local energy communities, and we see an important role for urban neighborhoods to map or even break down national energy plans on, on neighborhood level. Next slide, please. Um, first, uh, Freshcom, which is a linear optimization model um, with the objective function to maximize the social welfare of a local energy community. Um, on the left-hand side in the figure, you see two strengths of the models. One is the uh, alloca allocation mechanism which means peer-to-peer -peer trading under different um, willingness to pay from the consumers and prosumers. And in orange, you see the second or one of the strengths, um, which means the dynamic participation of new members inside of the energy community. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So this is about Freshcom. And the second, the second model is Gusto, which is a tool, an open source tool for the optimal energy technology portfolio and technology dispatch on neighborhood level, which minimizes the total annual costs of energy supply in multiple energy carrier systems. Um, furthermore, different operation strategies are also possible for small scale batteries, for example, inside of the neighborhood or inside of the buildings, which means, for instance, profit maximization, but also the minimization of local excess or deficit, deficit by the consumers. And the model can be used to, to get insights um, of the trade-offs between local distributed renewable generation and supply from outside the community, and also find synergies or the competitive between the distribution grids and local energy storage systems. On the next slide, please get in contact with us via email or check the, the GitHub repository where you can find the existing versions of the modeling framework, but also future developed um, new functionalities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. And then we are going to uh, hear about the uh, macroeconomic models. So please, Hetty, uh, you will present Eximode. No? Ah, yes, thank you very yeah. much. Um, indeed, I'm here to present Exiomod. Exiomod is not an, uh, an energy model, but it's a macroeconomic model in the sense that it will calculate the economic and environment, environmental uh, effects of, for example, uh, changes in the energy mix due to the energy transition. Um, so one of the examples is that, uh, well, if, for example, changes in the energy mix occur, it does not just affect those sectors, the energy sector. So it also affects all those sectors that make use of the energy sector. And what this model does, it calculates how this uh, change in one sector basically waves through the rest of the economy. Uh, so one of the strengths of this model is that it has quite an elaborate underlying database, which is called Exiobase. Um, the model allows to, uh, in a flexible way, deal with this database. So if, for example, a certain nation would like to only look at its own nation and aggregate the rest of the world, such that the rest of the world is all in one region, uh, that's a possibility. Or, for example, if you would like to take a look at all countries in, um, in Europe as separate nations and then aggregate the rest of the, the world, that's also possible. So it's quite a flexible model. It's also flexible in the sense that uh, it allows you to uh, make choices um, in equations. So consumer behavior you can model in different ways and uh, it's flexible in that sense. So what kind of output can you expect from this model? 
um, still previous slide please. It's for example uh, employment effect, output, um, uh, output per sector, household consumption, etc. So now next slide please, thank you. Uh, uh, examples of where we uh, use this model is for example for the European Commission where we looked at uh, what is the effect of uh, fuel efficiency measures in heavy duty vehicles? How does that impact not just that specific sector, but also, uh, for example, the transport sector that will have higher cost of purchasing those vehicles, but might have lower fuel costs because of, of those measures? Also, for on the circular economy topic, uh, we did uh, some studies for the Dutch government, but also for some Dutch uh, provinces. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then if you would like to, if you have, uh, are interested and would like to have more information, here's the website or you can contact me via this uh, email address. That's it. Thank you very much, Hetty. We are a little bit behind schedule, but uh, I hope you will stay and listen to the presentation of the last tool, uh, the REMES tool. So please, Paolo. Okay, uh, so what I present now is the REMSU model, which is a CG model for the European uh, count for the European countries for Europe. Um, it is a model of uh, of uh, that that computes in the next slide. We can see that it is a model that computes the future projections for for what concerns ma major economic variables like prices, quantities, imports, and exports value added and unemployment given uh, a policy so that we have that could be for example the the uh, decrease in uh, in co2 budget what happens in the different uh, european countries and similarly to what Hattie presented uh, in uh, her uh, pitch uh, it, it computes the spillover effects between different uh, between different uh, countries or different sectors in this case also uh, the computations are made based on what is called complementarity conditions. So what it does, it it it's, it ensures that supply and demand of each commodity are are uh, balanced through prices. So the prices are the, the, the devices that ensure the balancing between supply and demand, and also it ensures that every sector that doesn't have a, a positive profitability, so that is at loss, will not operate. And it's based on, on availability of resources, so, so, so and, and their economic evaluation, which means that uh, we will have amount of, a, a given amount of labor force, a given amount of capital, but also a given amount of different resources, like for example, oil, gas, minerals, uh, CO2 budget is another resource that can be reduced, and therefore we will have a higher price for the CO2 uh, um, uh, um, emissions. So and and normally mo uh, policies are modeled by by being by taxes or subsidies and by changing the availability of resources or by changes in productivity. So uh, yeah, in the next slide, uh, it has been used already in uh, in other. Uh, um, it has been used already in, in the Setna project and the Norwegian version in uh, Norwegian uh, project called Roadmap. Where we, for example, have computed the impact of on the GDP of, of in this case, could be the, of the European countries. It was done for Norway, though, for for uh, the phase out of oil and gas, and what is what happens when the conventional fuels are drastically reduced, while new technology, for example, has hydrogen are fostered. So what happens to the industry in terms of growth? What happens to the value added of different uh, sectors? Implications of electricity prices. And for example, what could be the impact of, of the of, on the unemployment? Yeah, that's uh, for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paolo. Uh, we are behind schedule, so uh, uh, I will end this session now. But you have got the information of how to contact each of the modelers about their models. So if you have questions to them, please do not he hesitate to contact them. So thank you all for joining this session. Thank you for thank you to the presenters, both uh, uh, the, uh, for the first part of the session and for the modelers in the end, uh, and for um, uh, the questions raised by the audience. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.